back to back to school. Yeah, looks like school, nice school benches. So. <laughs> it's good, huh? So uh, you can do whatever you. Yeah, please, whatever you, whatever you prefer. Yeah, yeah, sure, of course. Yeah, no worries. So, okay, good morning, everyone. Yeah. Yeah, good morning. <laughs> Very good. Huh? So uh, let us start uh, this little course in the uh, 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas. Uh, and um, uh, the purpose of this, I have never really taught quite like this before, so it's going to be interesting for everyone, including myself, hopefully. <laughs> but uh, the, uh, the idea is to you know, look at the Dhamma from different kind of points of view. Uh, and when you look at the Dhamma from different points of view, you get different understanding and different ideas about it. So this is just a slightly different angle on the Dhamma, but the, uh, the way the actual teachings are often very much the same, it's just that the angle is slightly different. Uh, so you'll be, uh, you know, most many of the things are things you hear, have heard about before, but hopefully things will maybe click into different, slightly different ways uh, so that you uh, gain, a, hopefully, a broader understanding of what these things are about. Uh, and uh, the, um, the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, uh, what is interesting about them, these 37 aids to awakening, uh, is that the Buddha says that this is essentially what his teaching is about. Uh, yeah, if you're going to summarize the Buddha's teaching into kind of one set, uh, one of the ways of doing that is to say these 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas. So I'm going to start off by just a little bit of background. Uh, so this is one of the background uh, uh, suttas, and this is taken from the Mahaparinibbana Sutta, the Buddha's passing, a great passing away, and this is where he talks about these sort of issues. Uh, because, as I mentioned before here, when the Buddha knows that he is about to pass away, uh, then of course he lays down what are the important things for the Sangha to remember after his death, uh, what is the essence of his teachings, and all of these kind of things. So it's a very interesting sutta in many ways, uh, and uh, this is just a short extract from that, very similar to what we have seen already here. So. The Buddha went with Ananda to the hall with the peaked roof. This is on page 82 in this little booklet. Uh, and said to him, Go, Ananda, gather all the mendicants staying in the vicinity of Vesali together in the assembly hall. Uh, yes, sir, replied Ananda. He did what the Buddha asked, went up to him, bowed, stood to one side, and said to him, Sir, the mendicant Sangha has assembled. Please, sir, go at your own convenience. So here we have the Buddha asking Venerable Ananda, who was his main attendant, to gather all the monastics, yeah, mendicants, all the monastics together. So obviously he must have some important message. Yeah, go and get them all together, uh, get them to come to the assembly hall. So the m most monasteries would have like an, what is called an upatana sala, which is a place where they would meet together. Yeah, yeah and they would kind of have. Uh, Sangha Kamas, they would uh, do monastic kind of duties and things, uh, and also they would have meetings of this kind of, of this kind. Then the Buddha went to the assembly hall where he sat down on the seat spread out and addressed the mendicants. So, mendicants, having carefully memorized those things I have taught you from direct knowledge, you should cultivate, develop, ma develop uh, and make much of them, uh, so that this spiritual practice uh, may last for a long time. That will be for the welfare, happiness of people, for the benefit, welfare and happiness of gods and humans. Uh, and what are those things that I have taught from my direct knowledge? Uh, they are the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, in other words, the four satipatthanas, uh, the four right efforts, uh, the four bases of psychic powers, this is the four idipadas, uh, the five faculties, the five powers, uh, the seven factors of awakening, uh, and the noble eightfold path. Uh, these are the things I have taught from my direct knowledge. Having carefully memorized them, uh, you should cultivate, develop, and make much of them, uh, so that this spiritual practice may last for a long time. Uh, that will be for the welfare and happiness of people for the benefit, welfare and happiness of gods and humans. So uh, this is uh, what the Buddha 
says to the monks what they should remember. Uh, yeah, this is what you should remember, this is what you should practice, uh, this is what you should kind of bring into the future so as to be beneficial for uh, humanity or, or both gods and humans, he says here. Uh, so in a way he's saying here that this is the essence of my teaching and he, he's saying that elsewhere as well. This can be summarized as the essential aspect of the Dhamma that he has taught them over 45 years. Uh, and uh, so the, f the first thing here that he says here is that having carefully memorized those things, uh, and of course this is just in the ancient um, Indian context, the idea of all the teachings are memorized because it was an uh, oral tradition, uh, and whatever teachings existed, they existed in people's memories. Memorization was of course important. Uh, uh, and uh, so the entire teaching was memorized. But that's only the beginning here, the memorization. Uh, and then, because then he says that you should cultivate these things, develop and make much of them. Uh, and it is really only in that cultivation and the development of these practices, uh, of this Dhamma, that it actually lasts into the future. Uh, memorization is not enough, uh, and I'm sure you uh, know what that means, because uh, it is uh, uh, the, the, uh, the uh, understanding of these things really only happens uh, when you actually realize them, when you practice them accordingly. Uh, that is when they, it actually becomes real. Uh, and, uh, and so often you can feel that. You can feel that when someone has practiced well uh, and they have realized these things, there is a different authority in the way that these things are taught with. You get this feeling that something comes from direct experience rather than coming just from uh, an intellectual or you know, superficial understanding of these things. So the cultivation of these dhammas is fundamental. Uh, and it is often, I have often found it myself in my own life that when uh, you get the Buddhist uh, Dhamma together with people who have cultivated it well. Uh, it is that double impression which is so powerful uh, because you have the ancient text on the one hand, uh, the ancient texts that go back all the way to the Buddha, and then you have the living example in the present day. And together it makes for a very powerful combination that is very uh, authentic in a sense. Uh, and uh, as I mentioned before, one of the advantages of that is that uh, instead of having a religion whereby the, you know, the uh, uh, whereby the people around you or your teacher is the person who is the final guru. Uh, uh, the final guru in Buddhism is always the Buddha. Uh, and this is what is so good about it, because it puts everyone on more of an equal footing, because we all take the Buddha as our teacher, uh, which is very useful. You don't have the same kind of guru uh, worship or guru uh, that you often have in other, in, in some traditions or some uh, teachings. Uh, and I think this is one of the great things, so we can all kind of take the final reference to be the Buddha, and it takes away some of the problems that sometimes can arise in religious organizations, and you see this around the world all the time. Uh. So you practice, and then that realization, you see the teachings working. Uh. One thing is to read something on a piece of paper, uh. it may seem nice, but this somehow it's a bit dry. Uh. Yeah, but when you see it in practice, that when it becomes, it comes alive, uh, and you get this feeling, yeah, this is it, uh, this is the real, the real deal. Uh. So the practice is obviously a very important part of this. Also, it is important for interpretation, uh, because it is strange, you know, you, you read the Buddha suttas, and sometimes they seem very straightforward, uh, and you think you know what they mean. Sometimes it may not be as straightforward, sometimes it can be a little bit cryptic, perhaps. Uh, but uh, it's strange how, uh, how different, at least in some cases, uh, the interpretation are, even of these teachings. Uh, and uh, that is kind of surprising. So for that reason, to kind of keep the interpretation on a, in, in, a, in a roughly the right, uh, right according to how the Buddha saw it, uh, the realization of these teachings <laughs> is fundamental. Uh, and then you get the right interpretation. Uh, so they always have to go hand in hand. Uh, this is how they last into the future, and this is why the Buddha says that, uh, you know, it is the noble ones that carry the Dhamma along, uh, and without them, the Dhamma basically tends to get lost. And this teaching that he, we are supposed to memorize and practice in this way, is a teaching that the Buddha says, I have taught you from my direct knowledge. In other words, the Buddha has um, seen these teachings, yeah, it's like an insight into the Four Noble Truths. Uh, and uh, uh, so even the path is something that he has seen, uh, which is perhaps, I don't know, is, is that 
that makes sense. It's interesting that you can sort of understand why he might see non-self or emptiness or something like that, which is like a, an insight into an aspect of reality. But how you can see the path may not be so obvious, because a path, is that really an aspect of the world? And maybe to some extent it is, but uh, I think part of that insight into the path is simply to remember that the Buddha himself, uh, he practiced the same path. Uh, he practiced the Eightfold Path because it is the only path to awakening. Of course, he had a bit of a bumpy ride. Uh, yeah, even the, the Buddha, Buddha, it sounds strange to say, but he had a bumpy ride on his practice in this path because he didn't know what he was doing here. And we have just at the very first part of this retreat, we were looking at the life of the Buddha, and we could see, for those of you who weren't there, you can see how bumpy it was, how the Buddha was fumbling around and making a lot of mistakes on the way before he actually found the, uh, you know, the solution. <laughs> So because he has practiced the path, uh, he knows the way to get there. And this is part of the reason uh, why he understands uh, the path uh, through direct insight. Uh. Another reason is, of course, because when you know the result, uh, you also know that result will also inform you about how to get there. Because if the result is high purity, well, obviously you have to live a pure life to be able to get to the high purity. So the result will also say something about the path. So this is how you gain insight into the path, uh, which may, may be a little bit strange, yeah, insight into the path. Uh, but that's, that seems to be how it is. Uh. I should say that if you would like to ask questions uh, as we go along, please do so, because uh, in my experience, if it's a bit more interactive, then people are a bit more engaged, perhaps. Uh, yeah, otherwise, uh, after a while, you kind of just tune out, you know, you kind of heard so much and you, oh, that can't take any more. Uh, so, but I'd like you to tune in instead. Uh, yeah, so please tune in. So if you um, uh, would like to ask questions as we go along, please feel free to do so, uh, so that we can uh, have a bit more interaction. Uh. So, um, this, so this is, uh, so so that this is kind of the core, yeah, the essence of the teachings. This is what you should practice, this is what you should cultivate. Uh, and, uh, f and this is obviously what is for the welfare and happiness of humans and gods. Uh, because this is what creates happiness in the world. This is the path that makes you move from dukkha to sukkha. And everyone wants more sukkha, nobody really wants more dukkha in their life, you've got enough of that already, so this is why it is for the benefit, welfare and happiness of everyone. Uh. But then we come to what these things are, yeah, this is kind of the interesting thing here. Uh. What are these things? Uh. And um, these things are, I just read them out before, the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, yeah, the four satipatthanas, uh, all about meditation practice, uh. The four right efforts, uh, the Samma Padana, which is also the sixth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, the four bases of psychic power, the Idipadas, uh, the five faculties, these are the five mental um, abilities that you have. Uh, five powers is very much the same thing. Uh, seven factors of awakening, the things that make awakening possible, and the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and what is so interesting about this 37, one of the things that is interesting about them uh, is that they are very practical. Uh, all of these things have to do with what we uh, should do, how we should live, uh, how we need to uh, use our mind to make progress on the, uh, on the path. Uh, so very, very practical things. Uh, and this is one of the things that stands out about the Buddhist teachings, uh, is that they are pragmatic, practical, they are for the purpose of application. It is not a doctrine, it is not a philosophy, it is not just some kind of, uh, you know, thought out thing. It is a very practical thing, how to move from A to B, how to go from Dukkha to Sukkha. It's the best thing, yeah, how to go from Dukkha to Sukkha, nothing is better than but that, obviously. Yeah. And uh, so this is a very practical path. Uh, uh, it is not just practical, however, because nothing can just be practice. Uh, as I mentioned before, any practice has to be in the context of something, uh, and the co has to have a context. O a path only has meaning if it has a context. Uh, and the context here is the context of the Four Noble Truths, uh, yeah, about happiness and suffering in life, uh, and these things. And this is actually included in this. Uh, because if you remember the Noble Eightfold Path, this starts out with right view, and right view obviously is the four, uh, the four Noble Truths. Uh, it's more than that, but that is a very important part of it. Uh, 
And the four noble truths are first of all the noble truth of Dukkha, you can say the noble truth of Sukkha if you like, because these things are go together, where you have Dukkha, you have Sukkha, uh, uh, and the other way around. But also you have the origin of, uh, of Dukkha. What is the origin of Dukkha? It's Tanha, it's craving, but uh, remember that the expanded uh, formula for the origin of Dukkha is dependent origination. Dependent origination shows you how Dukkha arises out of avidja, avidja being often translated as ignorance or delusion. Huh? So out of delusion, out of this cloud of not knowing, arises Dukkha. Huh? Yeah, so that is kind of a theoretical framework, if you like, and that is actually included in the Noble Eightfold Path. Huh? And then you have the third noble truth, which is the ending of dukkha. Yeah, that is uh, the uh, inverse or the opposite of dependent origi origination. It's called dependent cessation. And when you make the beginning cease, when you make an end of delusion and you give rise to uh, true knowledge, true insight instead, the whole thing ceases. Uh, so all of these core teachings of the Buddha, the five aggregates, whatever, that may seem theoretical, they're actually include, included in this practical path because they give a framework, they give the possibility for understanding what the path is about. And uh, so this is, uh, so it is practical, uh, but there is also a minimum of understanding required for the whole thing to make sense, otherwise it just falls apart. So. Um, these are the 37, and uh, perhaps you think 37 is a lot of things to remember. How am I going to remember 37 factors? Uh, yeah, can you? Does anyone here know all the 30, 37? Uh, you know, you know all 37? Yeah. Uh, yes. No. You, 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 I thought you were nodding your head. Uh, yes. Not nodding. <laughs> Yeah, so, so if you, exactly, so if you remember those, uh, you basically can, and then you know the set within each one, you can know the 37, that's true. Huh? But sometimes there's a lot to remember, yeah, 37. So one of the nice things about these 37 is that they also reduce down to the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, they are really equivalent to the Noble Eightfold Path. So what, what is the difference then? And the difference is that uh, the 37 is like an expansion. Uh, it is like seeing the Noble Eightfold Path in more details. Uh, yeah? And when you get a more detailed understanding of things, uh, then often that helps you to uh, kind of clarify what is going on. Uh. So it's in more details, and this is kind of an important part of it. Another aspect of this, and I will show you this in a second, is that it shows you different stages of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh. There is the initial stage when you start out, and then there is the more, kind of more, you can say, I don't like the word advanced because it sounds like some kind of PhD or something, but it's not, nothing to do with PhDs. Yeah? But it's more, uh, it, when you go further on the path, then the path becomes more part of you. Huh? And this is part also of these 37 factors. It shows you different times uh, when you practice this path. Huh? Yeah? So it shows you the path from different angles and different viewpoints in more detail. And this is really the purpose of these 37. Huh? So if everything can be expanded out and contracted in various ways. Uh, and this is kind of one of the nice things about this Dhamma. The Noble Eightfold Path can also be contracted even more. It can be contracted into the threefold practice. You have Sila, Samadhi, Panya, uh, morality, uh, meditation and wisdom. And uh, can that be contracted uh, even more? That probably can. Yeah, uh, Everything can be contracted more and expanded more if you want to. Uh, so, but this is, uh, so these are the 37. So, let us see how it is that they interact with the Noble Eightfold Path. What do they actually mean in, more, in a little bit more detail before we, before we move on? Uh, and uh, the four kinds of mindfulness meditation here, the four Satipatthanas, this is uh, Ajahn Sujato's translation, who you may have heard of. Uh, and uh, so this is why the translation may seem a little bit unfamiliar. But, um, uh, this is, of course, equivalent to the seventh factor uh, of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, yeah, the seventh factor being Samma Sati, right mindfulness. Uh, so this is just an expansion of that, uh, showing you the four, uh, the four Satipatthanas. Uh, so nothing too exciting about that, really. Uh, then we have the four right efforts. Uh, this is the same as the Samma Vayama or Samma Padana, sixth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, so this is just an expansion of that, that one, uh, and it shows you that in more detail. Uh, then we have the four Idipadas, the four bases of psychic power, or, or four bases or the four foundations of 
spiritual power, if you like, uh, or psychic power. And uh, this is really just a way how to achieve samadhi. It looks at how to achieve samadhi in four different ways, uh, depending on uh, how developed your mind is and all of these kind of things. Uh, so in a sense it is the uh, application of the mind to attain samadhi. So it, it, is, it is a bit like the three last factors of the Noble Eightfold Path. It explains those in a, in a bit of detail. Uh, so how to use effort and then mindfulness and how that results in samadhi in four different ways. Uh, we're going to have a little bit of more look on those later on, uh, but there isn't all that much information about them in the suttas. So I'm, goin I'm going to look at that fairly quickly here. Then we have the five faculties. Uh, Panch Indriya, which is a, an, an interesting set, and uh, I will have a look at those in a little bit of detail later on. Uh, and uh, what are they all about, and what they are about? They show the Noble Eightfold Path uh, from the point of view of the Noble Ones. Uh, yeah, once you become an Arya, once you have full insight into the, nob into the Four Noble Truths, uh, that is when you have the Five Indriyas. Uh, so it shows you the path from the point of view of someone who has understood the teaching of the Buddha through direct insight. Uh, and uh, if you look at those Five Indriyas, just very briefly, uh, you can see why that is the case. The first one is the Sad Indriya, uh, the faculty of uh, uh, sadda, which can be translated as confidence or faith or something like that. Uh, and uh, at the point when you become a, 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 you know, a, a stream enterer or you see the Dhamma for yourself, at that point your faith is what they call confirmed, or it is established, or it is unshakable, because you know what is going on. Yeah? So that is the kind of the basis for the uh, uh, for the practice, and that is why uh, at this point it becomes automatic. You know what's going on, you have internalized the Four Noble Truths, uh, you have these indriyas, you have these abilities, uh, they are installed in your mind like a programmer. Yeah, so now you become the Dhamma robot, because uh, the program is there. It's a nice way of thinking about it. Usually we are kind of worldly robots, we go around seeking for sensual pleasures, yeah, doing, 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 doing this, doing that. Now you become the Dhamma robot instead. Uh, so this is kind of the nice thing, going to Nibbana like a zombie, no choice. <laughs> so, so it's a nice way of thinking about it, because uh, sometimes we need to get out of this uh, idea that we have all that much choice in life, uh, and that actually we are, in large parts, we are programmed uh, to do what we are doing. Uh, so this is the, what's happening here over the next three days, is the Buddhist programming. Yeah? We're going to program everyone, so that program gets installed. I'm going to also be programming myself. This is kind of nice, you program yourself as well. Huh? But it's a very happy kind of programming, huh? because it leads you in a good direction. Huh? So this is why, at this point, you are fully programmed. And uh, because of that, you can see, uh, because you have that full faith in the Buddha, you know what it is about. Uh, it is said for that for the Aryans, the morality is established. Uh, yeah? You know what the morality is, you have seen this with direct insight, because it is your view, you can't really go wrong anymore in morality, because you're carrying that view with you at all times. Uh, so you always know roughly what you have to do. This is always in a kind of at the back of your mind, actually it's even at the front of your mind a lot. Uh, so you don't really make big mistakes in morality anymore. And this is why the Noble One is said to be perfect in morality. Uh, yeah, the sila is established. Uh, and that's why for the five Indriyas, you don't, there's nothing there about morality. This is one of the big differences between the Indriyas and the Eightfold Path. Uh, there's nothing about morality in the Indriyas. Uh, why? Because you've gone beyond that already. No need for morality, because it's already part of you. Uh. So that's why I start off with Sadda, and then it goes straight to Virya, which is the next one. Uh. Yeah, the virya is the energy, uh, the energy that arises uh, because, uh, why? Because you know the Dhamma and then you have a natural energy wanting to fulfill the practice. Uh, the energy is just there and you kind of practice that energy. Uh, and with that energy comes mindfulness, when the mind is energetic, uh, uh, mindfulness is just behind. Uh, and. Uh, you, w uh, you will often realize that the, the reason why the mind is not energetic is often because 
to, to many defilements. Uh, and the reason why the mind is not mindful is also because of defilements very often. Uh, so as the defilements disappear gradually, and that's what they do when you have very strong confidence and faith, the energy will be there quite naturally. Uh, the mindfulness will be there. And then the, when the mindfulness is there, then the samadhi happens from that. Uh, mindfulness is always the cause of samadhi. And one of those very important things to understand about the Buddhist path, uh, how from mindfulness comes samadhi. Yeah? The reason we want to be mindful is to achieve a samadhi later on. Uh, and then the last one is then the panya, the, the, the wisdom uh, that arises from deep meditation practice. Uh. So these are the five indriyas and they are lodged in the mental or psychological makeup of the noble one. So these are, that's what they call faculties. Faculty means something like a power or an ability. It is something that you carry with you at all times. Uh, uh, you have that wisdom, you have that faith, uh, and you have the ability in meditation as well as an Aryan, as a noble one. Uh. So it shows you the path from a slightly different perspective. But really, it is just the Noble Eightfold Path uh, from the noble perspective. Uh. So that is the uh, five indriyas. Uh, the five balas, I'm going to talk about them in more detail later on. And then you have the five balas, five powers. These are very similar to the five indriyas. Uh, in fact, so similar it is hard to really make a distinction between them. Uh, and I will show you one sutta that talks about the panchabala. And that one sutta says just basically that the panchabala is the same as the panch indriya. That's pretty much all it says. Uh, must have been confusion already at the time of the Buddha. What's the difference, Master? Actually, they are the same. They're just different angles, maybe, of looking at the same thing. Yeah. Then you have the seven factors of awakening. Yeah. And the seven factors of awakening, they are really an expansion of the last two factors uh, of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh. Yeah, the seven factors of awakening, they begin with the Sati Sambhujanga, the mindfulness factor of awakening, uh, and then they go stage by stage all the way to the, the, s the sixth Sambhujanga is the Samadhi Sambhujanga, and then you have the Upekka Sambhujanga is the seventh one. Uh. And so it shows you in detail how uh, from mindfulness uh, you get to Samadhi, you get to Upekka, eventually Upekka is the highest kind of Samadhi, yeah? fourth jhana, that kind of thing. Uh. Uh, so it shows you this thing in detail. So it's an expansion of the last two factors. Uh. You can see now how it all fits together very beautifully. Yeah, you have the four satipatthanas, uh, the four right efforts. This is the expansion of the sixth and the seventh factor. Then you have the four idipadas, which is an expansion of the last three factors in a certain way. You have the seven factors of awakening, which is also an expansion of the last two factors. Uh, and then you have the five indriyas and five balas, uh, which are just an alternative way of looking at the noble eightfold path from the viewpoint of the noble ones. Uh. And then the last one is the Noble Eightfold Path itself, uh, yeah, which comes last, uh, and which obviously is the most important one, uh, because this is what the Buddha, how the Buddha normally taught the path in the suttas. Uh. Yeah, so it all fits together. It's all one thing. It's all kind of congealed together into one entity called the Buddhist path. Uh, we here given thirty-seven factors, uh, and this is what it is about. Uh. So. Uh, what is, uh, what is interesting about this uh, and what is kind of useful to perhaps uh, think, uh, look at uh, when it comes to these 37 factors uh, is to uh, kind of analyze all the various aspects of these factors. There are 37 factors there, but of those 37, there are some things that recur almost in every set. Uh, yeah? So for example, you have mindfulness. Now, mindfulness occurs, of course, in the four satipatthanas. Uh, you have it there. Uh, but you also have mindfulness in the five indriyas, the five spiritual faculties. Uh, you have the mindfulness in the panchabala, the five powers. Uh, you have mindfulness in the seven factors of awakening. In fact, you can argue that you have it twice there. Dhammavichya Sambhujanga, which is the investigation of qualities, mental qualities, and also in the Satipatthanas. Uh, and then you have it in the Noble Eightfold Path. So you have it many, many times. You count those up. You get four, five, four, five, s six, seven, eight, nine maybe, depending a little bit on how you, on how you count these things. Possibly nine uh, different versions of it. Uh. Then you have the Padana, the right effort. Uh, yeah, similar again. You find it in the four right efforts. You find it in the each of these sets. So maybe eight of those. Uh, no, but you don't, you don't find it in the, 
it, we find it sometimes it's called virya. Virya is similar to padana. So sometimes we can com put virya and padana together into one thing. Yeah. Virya means energy. Padana means effort. So they are slightly different, actually, and I will talk about the difference between the two later on. Uh, but for practical reasons, we can kind of are say that they are roughly the same thing in this case. Uh, and then the last one is samadhi. Samadhi you find across the board. Uh, you find it in the four idipadas. Uh, you find it again in the uh, indriyas, in the balas. You find it in the sambhujangas, the seven factors of awakening, and in the noble eightfold path. Yeah. So samadhi also is everywhere. Uh, uh, so these are the factors you find a lot of. Uh, and so what that means is that uh, the focus, all of these things are basically about the development of the mind. Yeah? Right effort, uh, right mindfulness and right samadhi all are about the bhavana. Bhavana in Buddhism meaning like development, uh, especially development of the mind. Uh, so this is, if you like, the core of what Buddhism really is about, mental development. Uh, yeah, and you get this feeling when you when you look compare all of these things together, you get this feeling that mental development is kind of the crucial thing about these thirty-seven bodhi pakya dhammas, as they are called. And uh, the other factors are more rare. The sila factors are obviously very important, but they are more of a basic part. The sila, the morality, is something Buddhism shares with other religions and also with non-religions as well. Uh, but uh, and a lot of people have some degree of sila, but the mental development is really the essence, if you like, of the Buddhist path. Uh, and from that comes the wisdom. Yeah, the, w the wisdom is actually mentioned very rarely. Uh, it's kind of interesting, yeah, there's not that, well, that much about wisdom in the 37 factors. Uh, it is mentioned in the five indriyas, but it's not something... So it's mentioned w once or twice, and then you have the faith mentioned once or twice, uh, but it's not very prominent. Uh, why is that? And the, the reason for that, of course, is that uh, it is the path that matters in Buddhism. Wisdom is more like the result of the path. Uh, so as long as you practice the path, uh, the wisdom arises as a consequence of your practice. Uh, so you don't really need to kind of put it in there so much. Uh, especially the higher wisdom that happened at the very end of the path. So uh, there you are. So what are these uh, 37? Uh, and uh, they are called uh, in uh, uh, late, not in the suttas, but in later Buddhism, they're called the 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas, uh, Satta Tingsa Bodhipakya Dhammas. Uh, Bodhipakya, uh, Bodhi means awakening. Pakya or Pakka means side or wing. Yeah? So a bird has a Pakka, has a wing. Uh, uh, or you have a a division in the Sangha, yeah, two sides uh, to the Sangha. Uh, one is uh, different pakkas, different factions uh, in the Sangha. It's like uh, when you kind of w when you have a discussion or something like that. Uh, or it can be just the side. So there are the 37 things that are siding with awakening. So in other words, the 37 aids to awakening here. Uh. In the suttas, they're not called this because in the suttas they are not found under one name like that. Uh, but in the suttas, instead, they are uh, just found as a group in a number of places. Uh, and just like uh, here, uh, they are grouped together as, as one thing in this particular way. Uh, not actually called 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas. Uh. So, uh, uh, so, that this, so that is it. And that is uh, just in brief uh, what these things are about. And. Uh, uh, as long as we keep on remem remembering these things, uh, as long as we keep on practicing them, uh, then we are carrying Buddhism on into the future. Uh, uh, and this is what the Buddha says here and in other places. Uh, this is how you keep Buddhism alive. This is the essence of what it is about. Uh, so that's why he says, uh, uh, these are the things I have taught from my direct knowledge. Uh, Having carefully memorized them, you should cultivate, develop, uh, and make much of them so that this spiritual practice may last for a long time. Uh, that would be for the welfare and happiness of the people, for the benefit, welfare, and happiness of gods uh, and humans. Uh. <coughs> so, uh, uh, there you are. Uh, that is the uh, kind of the background to this, why these 37 are so important. Uh, and uh, that they can be considered a summary of the entire Buddhist teachings. Uh. So, does that make sense to everyone? Uh, yeah? Uh, okay, good. Uh. So, uh, 
Now I'm going to have a look at uh, another sutta which uh, talks basically about these uh, same kind of qualities but from a slightly different way. And this is uh, uh, from uh, also found in the Mahapanibbana Sutta, but it's also an individual Sutta found in the Sangyutta Nikaya. This is at Nalanda. Nalanda, of course, being where the famous university existed later on. But at the time of the Buddha, it was just a tiny little place, a little village. And it is supposed to be the village where Venerable Sariputta came from. Uh, yeah, this was his origin place. Uh, and uh, so Sariputta often is connected with Nalanda, and so he is in this particular discourse as well. Uh, yeah, so he is the one who speaks this particular discourse. Uh, and this is supposed to have happened on the way when the Buddha left Rajagaha on his last journey. That's why it is part of the Mahaparinibbana Sutta. When the Buddha walked from Rajagaha, the first place he walked to was uh, uh, well, first was Ambalatika and then was Nalanda afterwards. Uh, and Nalanda is quite close to Rajagaha, Rajagaha being the capital of the ancient Magadan Empire, or it was only a kingdom at this stage, uh, became an empire later on. Uh. This is one of the first places that he came to, and there he had a conversation with Venerable Sariputta, uh, who, um, uh, who seems to have stayed there at the time. Uh. So. Uh, at one time, the Buddha was staying near Nalanda in Pavarika's mango grove. Have you noticed how they always stayed in mango groves? <laughs> it's very wise, isn't it, to stay in a mango grove? You just kind of sit under the mango groves and wait for the mangoes to fall down. Yeah? And then you're very, very wise. <laughs> So they must have been very nice. Maybe mango grows are probably a bit like fruit orchards in the present day. If you have an orchard, you have all the fruit trees, uh, and it's quite open, probably quite suitable for uh, seclusion, uh, and, uh, and probably quite civilized, yeah, because it wasn't kind of just a jungle or whatever, so probably quite a pleasant stay, place to stay. Uh, and then you have the en ben benefit of being close to the mangoes at the same time. Uh, it's kind of nice. Uh. Then Sariputta went up to the Buddha, bowed down, uh, and sat down to one side and said to him, Sir, I have such confidence in the Buddha that I believe there is no other ascetic or Brahmin, whether past, future or present, uh, whose direct knowledge is superior to the Buddha when it comes to awakening. Uh, so this is quite an interesting statement already. Uh, yeah, where, the, where Sariputta uh, says about the Buddha that it is impossible to have more knowledge to be superior to the Buddha in terms of awakening. Uh, there is, in other words, there is only one type of awakening, uh, and that awakening is the same for everyone. Uh, uh, and which is uh, uh, an important statement because sometimes it is easy to kind of we tend to stratify people. We tend to consider some Buddhas as better than other Buddhas. Uh, in later Buddhas, there's the Adi Buddha. The Adi Buddha is like the top Buddha, yeah? and then there's kind of different kinds of Buddhas. Uh, and then we take to m make difference perhaps between the Pacheka Buddhas and the Samma Sam Buddhas. Uh, and we also make difference between the Arahants and the Buddhas. But really, there isn't any distinction even between Arahants and the Buddha. The awakening is actually the same. Uh. So uh, all of these, uh, the insight into reality is the same, uh, because it is a, an insight. Uh. Of course, it doesn't, it does not, this does not mean that there aren't differences. There are differences, and the differences is often in things like maybe your ability to teach, or your ability to articulate these teachings, uh, or you may have some extra side knowledges, yeah, like knowledges like supernormal powers, for example, uh, and these kind of things. There may be additional things. Uh, uh, or you may have just more worldly knowledge. Maybe you are, are better at applying the Dhamma teachings uh, to worldly situations. And that can also be quite useful. Uh, how do we apply the Dhamma in the modern world? Uh, that, of course, is a very interesting thing in its own right. Uh, but that also needs additional information. But in terms of the basic idea of awakening, uh, the insight is the same. Uh, and this is kind of, I think, a very important point. Uh, and, um, okay. And uh, then the Buddha replies, uh, that's a grand and dramatic statement, Sariputta. Uh, you have roared a definitive categorical lion's roar. Uh, so <laughs> this is uh, Adan Sudhato's translation. Uh, it's you had probably never heard quite that before. So, <laughs> so int interesting. So you have, 
Anyway, you have roared this lion's roar, and this is kind of one of the things that you see in the suttas in a number of places. The Buddha sometimes roars the lion's roar, and it's like when you say something, yeah, that is kind of a, a kind of state. You just state some, you state it as it is, yeah, and you kind of uh, uh, you don't mess around. That's kind of the lion's roar. It is kind of a confident roar. The idea of the lion is that the lion is confident, uh, and when the lion roars, the whole world kind of trembles. Uh, and it was interesting, I, I went to Africa a few, couple, two or three years ago. My parents invited me to Africa, so I thought, I better, maybe it must, it's nice to go along because your parents invite you. So I went with my whole family, went on a safari in Africa. And we were staying in this camp. And it was out on the, uh, the very famous um, place, the Serengeti uh, in, in uh, Tanzania, a very, very famous place for safari. It's very beautiful and very fascinating. Uh, and while we were staying in this camp, it was in the valley, there was big hills around us, yeah? And then at night, or in the evening, you could hear the lion roar, yeah? The lion was far away, but the whole valley was filled with the sound of the lion roaring. Yeah? And then I understood the suttas, yeah? Now I know what they mean. Yeah? Sometimes you have to hear this to really grasp what is going on, yeah? And you could kind of feel oh, the whole valley become silent when the lion roars, yeah? Everyone is kind of trembling a little bit uh, because now the lion is going to go out and hunt. Uh. And all the animals, no matter how big they are, they are afraid of lions. Even the elephants are afraid of lions. Uh. So this is the Buddha, the confident lion's roar, yeah? And everybody kind of listens and your hair stands on end when you hear the lion's roar. Yeah? Uh, okay. So, uh, and then the Buddha asks him, well, how do you know this, yeah? And, um, and one of the things that is happening in here, I actually have, I have uh, cut out quite a bit, that's why you have these little dots there, huh? but the Buddha asks him uh, about, you know, do you, can you read the minds of all these Buddhas in the past and the future? How do you know this? If you can't, you know, and, and so Buddha said, no, no, I can't read any, anyone's minds. Sariputta was famous for not having any psychic powers. Uh, he was only very wise, uh, yeah, and it shows you the, the wisest person in the Sangha, he had no psychic powers. Uh, that's kind of interesting, isn't it? Uh, it shows that psychic powers are really not what Buddhism is about. It's about wisdom, it's about insight. Uh, and then the Buddha asked him, well, how can you know this if you haven't got any psychic powers? Uh, and then now Sariputta is to tell us how he can know about the future and the past without psychic powers. Uh, and he says, sir, though I don't comprehend the minds of Buddha's past, future and present, uh, still I understand this by inference from the Dhamma, from the teaching. Uh, suppose there was a king's frontier citadel, uh, so that is like a fortress or something, with fortified embankments, ramparts and arches uh, in a single gateway. Uh, and it has a gatekeeper who is astute, competent and intelligent. Uh, he keeps strangers out and lets known people in. Uh, as he walks around the patrol path, uh, he doesn't see a hole or cleft in the wall, not even one big enough for a cat to slip out or in. Uh, he thinks, Whatever sizable creatures uh, enter or leave the citadel, all of them do via this gate. That's a simile. In the same way, uh, I understand this by inference from the Dhamma, from the teaching. Uh, all the perfected ones, fully awakened Buddhas, uh, with the past, present or future, uh, give up the five hindrances, uh, corruptions of the heart that weaken wisdom. Uh, the mind is firmly established in the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, the four satipatthanas. Uh, they correctly develop the seven awakening factors, uh, the satta sambhujanga, and then they wake up uh, to the supreme, perfect awakening. Yeah. So here you have the Buddha, this is a famous, or, or Sariputta rather, with this quite well-known simile uh, of how awakening happens. Uh, yeah, it is a uh, an understanding of how the mind works in the same way as you understand how a citadel or how a fortress works. Uh, when you look, walk around the fortress, you know that there is only one way of getting into this fortress, uh, and that is through the gate. It's a single entrance, uh, yeah, and there is no other way because you cannot see any holes, you can't see any places where it's possible to get through. Uh. And of course, that's the whole idea with a, a citadel, that no enemies can get in uh, and that you are 
uh, uh, that you are blocking anyone except your mates and your friends. Uh, mates is the Australian term, yeah? You can't, uh, uh, blocking your mates from, ca uh, your mates can come into the citadel. Uh. So, uh, one uh, entry, uh, yeah? And of course that one entry is here, the path, yeah, the Noble Eightfold Path or whatever. Uh, and there is a beautiful simile elsewhere in the sutta that talks in a similar kind of way. Uh, and it talks about the gatekeeper being mindfulness. Uh, so the gatekeeper here is mindfulness. You have an astute and competent gatekeeper. That means you have a gatekeeper, mindfulness that keeps out ill will, yeah, keeps out defilements, uh, but lets in all the good qualities of mind, lets in the metta, the compassion, the karuna and wisdom, and keeps everything out. Uh, so you have to make sure that you have a good, nice, good gatekeeper. Uh, so is your gatekeeper, is he wiser, or is she wiser, or is uh, your gatekeeper kind of silly sometimes? Uh, it lets in the bad, the wrong kind of qualities. Uh, it's difficult to get the perfect gatekeeper here, yeah? and this is one of the problems with the path. Uh, and this shows you that being the gatekeeper is not enough. Uh, it is not enough to be mindful, uh, because sometimes you need to do something. Uh, you need to be a wise gatekeeper that takes the right action uh, when something doesn't go right. That's why you have to be astute, exactly, and intelligent and wise. Uh, otherwise, it just doesn't work out. Uh, so, uh, and this is one of the things you find uh, nicely explained in the right efforts, uh, and we're going to have to have a look more of look at the right four right efforts later on. Uh, but this simile kind of gives you an idea of what is going on here. Uh. Uh, this is the beautiful thing about similes, it kind of brings things alive a little bit, and this simile here is really kind of nice in bringing things alive. Uh. So, the citadel is like the person in this case. Uh. Um, so, uh, uh, then uh, you, you know, because you have practiced the same Dhamma uh, and because you know the path, you know that the only way to really get in and to actually reach awakening is uh, through developing these factors in exactly the same way as the city. Uh, uh, yeah, you know that if you, ha if you have uh, hindrances in the mind, uh, then there's absolutely no way that you are going to be able to see anything clearly because you know from personal experience that the hindrances, they weaken the mind. Uh, the mind loses its strength, uh, its ability to see clearly, because the mind is biased, uh, the mind is scattered, uh, the mind is all over the place, unable to focus properly. Uh, and this is uh, the problem with the five hindrances. Uh. So you uh, give up the five hindrances, uh, yeah, once they are given, given up, then you, have, you are firmly established in the four kinds of mindfulness meditation. Uh, and this is the idea of firmly established here, is a slight alternative to the ordinary way that mindfulness or satipatthana is described in the suttas. Normally it's just called the four satipatthanas. Here it's called the satipatthanas that are supatitita citta. And this means that it is firmly established, and that is the satipatthana where the hindrances are completely gone. And this is satipatthana has like a twofold purpose in a sense. And one of the purposes is to help you abandon the hindrances. And when you read the Satipatthana Sutta, that's quite clear, yeah, it's all about understanding the hindrances, the defilements of the mind, then going beyond them. Uh, and the second purpose of Satipatthana is then to take you to Samadhi, and then after Samadhi also to attain insight. Uh, so Satipatthana is a very broad thing that includes a lot. Uh, and here it is Supatitita Chitta means it is the Satipatthana that happens as you move towards awakening, when, or to Samadhi, when the hindrances are already abandoned. And that's why they lead to the, f the seven factors of awakening here. Yeah, the seven factors of awakening come next, uh, and uh, you, uh, you, you practice Satipatthanas, they unify your mind, bring your mind together by, by you applying mindfulness in the right area, and then the seven factors of awakening arise, the joy, the tranquility, and then um, ultimately the samadhi and the upeka. And when you get to the upeka, at the very end of the seven factors of awakening, uh, then the supreme awakening happens. Uh, all you have to do is just wait for it to happen. It just comes to you, bang, and you are awakened. Uh. <laughs> so, so this, what is the nice thing about this? One of the reasons why I brought this sutta out for this particular purpose, uh, is that uh, it shows you a little bit about how the various factors of awakening work together. Uh, 
Yeah? Uh, first of all, we have here, you have to overcome the five hindrances. Uh, and part of that is Samma Padana practice, the, right, the four right efforts uh, that happen as a sixth factor of the Noble Eightfold Path. Uh, and then from that, you then move on to the four uh, Satipatthanas, the four kinds of mindfulness meditation, as it is translated here. Uh. So moving from the right effort, uh, overcoming the mental defilements, uh, going on to Satipatthana practice, which could be considered like mindfulness of breathing, for example. Yeah, you do your breath meditation. Uh, and then uh, from that breath meditation, then the seven factors of awakening arise. Uh, yeah, and out of that arising then comes the ending of the path. Uh. So it shows you the kind of the working together of some of these factors and how they interact with each other. Uh, and here they are, are shown then to interact in such a way that you uh, reach awakening, full awakening, ultimately. Yeah. So that is this little sutta, and one of the one of the nice things about this sutta as well, which I didn't really mention so far, is that uh, the Venerable Sariputta is here talking about inference, uh, yeah, using inference in the Dhamma. And uh, what is interesting about that is that. Uh, uh, sometimes we think about all of Buddhism about being direct insight uh, and seeing everything directly, like with a, a flash, bang, now you know what is going on. Uh, but Buddhism is actually about more than that. Buddhism is also about using inference, uh, about understanding things because it is a logical consequence of something else. Uh, this is what Venerable Sariputta is doing here. Yeah? If you are one of these guards on top of the wall and you walk around the city, you can't see any openings in the city, you know that no creature can come in. You haven't seen it for yourself. You haven't seen that no, cr no creatures are going in because it's not something you can't really see as such. Uh, but you know it inferentially because there is no opening there that is possible for them to come through. Yeah? This is what is meant by inference here. Uh, in the same way, in the Dhamma, uh, for example, when you are a stream enter, you know that all, uh, all conditioned phenomena are impermanent. Uh, yeah, that's what you know. Sabbe Dhamma Anicca is one of the things you know as a uh, stream enter. But of course, you cannot see all phenomena. It's impossible. You c all you can do is you can see sufficient phenomena to then make the inference that all phenomena are impermanent, that they are non-self, that they are dukkha. And so there is always a degree of inference in, in Buddhism. Uh, and, uh, so, and this is part of the insight, is that inference that happens at this particular point. Uh. So, uh, uh, there you are, that is the uh, uh, seven factors, 37 Bodhipakya Dhammas uh, in brief. And uh, what I am going to do next uh, is to start to look a little bit at these 37 factors. I'm going to uh, choose a slightly different sequence from what I have in this booklet, because I realized afterwards that I cannot just put a large number of suttas together that I thought were, would be nice, but uh, uh, I, th I think the sequence may not be ideal. So um, I'm going to start with looking at the spiritual faculties. Uh, and uh, they begin on page 102, uh, the five spiritual faculties, uh, and uh, we're going to uh, look at those first of all, uh, uh, and then we're going to have a look at maybe the Bhujangas, uh, and then we will have a look, uh, because a lot of these 37, they belong too closely to the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, that we're going to look at them in connection with the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, rather than looking at them as separate factors. Uh. So for that reason, I'm going to start with those that are not part of the Noble Eightfold Path, uh, and then move on to the Noble Eightfold Path uh, afterwards. Uh. But uh, before we move on to the next topic, uh, uh, let's have a break. Uh, yeah? uh, and let's meet back in here maybe at around uh, uh, 9.40 or so. It's 9.20 now, so maybe 9.40 is a good time. Uh, and then we'll continue with the five spiritual faculties. So. Okay.